Hi, welcome to my online screen making class. I'm Kevin Kelf with Chromaline. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your day to hang out with me and learn a little bit more about screen making. I'll go through um, emulsions, different types of emulsions, what the differences are, some of the common problems people have, and uh, how to rectify those problems. So with that, we'll get started. We'll begin simply with what is emulsion. It's a photosensitive chemical in either liquid, roll, or sheet form that is applied to the screen and used for the purpose of making a stencil. So we're going to talk about a couple different types, the direct emulsion or the sheet form, also known as capillary film, um, and what the differences are between those. There are three functions of the stencil, and when I talk about the stencil, I'm talking about the mesh and emulsion combination, which is the full stencil. Um, the three functions primarily are to define the non-image areas, which block the ink from going through the screen, define the image areas, the open areas of the screen, and helps meter ink to a limited degree. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more on that later, but primarily the thickness of your mesh is going to limit how much ink is being laid down um, for that given stencil. So there's a couple different stencil system categories. There's direct systems and indirect systems. Uh, we'll primarily be talking about direct systems. Indirect systems, I'll just touch on briefly. It's primarily a dead system nowadays. Um, but what indirect film is, is where you would you'd actually make the film, image it, develop it, and then apply that to your screen afterwards. Um, everybody, for the most part, uh, is using direct systems nowadays. Um, there's direct emulsion, capillary film, direct indirect, all of that falls under the direct system category. So direct systems, uh, one, of those, one of the direct systems is direct emulsion. Uh, direct emulsion is liquid form, which gets put into the scoop coater and then manually or auto, with an auto coater coated onto the screen. Um, some of the advantages of direct emulsion is primarily it's the most used. Everybody out there for the most part is using direct emulsion, especially in the textile industry. Uh, it's very durable against mechanical wear. It can be very solvent resistant. It can be coated to any thickness. So how you coat that screen, uh, we'll, get, we'll get into some of the variables later on, but it can be coated to any thickness. It's the least expensive system that's out there as well. Uh, some of the disadvantages, it's the most difficult to master. I guarantee no matter Who's out there coating screens? The first screen they did is not was not a perfect screen. Uh, some need to be sensitized, so whether it's a diazo-based or dual cure emulsion, it needs to be sensitized, and with that comes a limited shelf life. Uh, it can obviously be messy. I'm sure anybody coating screens can attest to that, that they've made a mess at some point in time with direct emulsion. Uh, and it's not freeze-thaw stable for the most part. Some are, but most aren't. What that means is, the emulsion can't freeze, whether it's in shipping or storage. If it freezes, it'll change the properties of that emulsion, uh, and you'll have problems with that. Another, another system in the direct systems is capillary film. So what capillary film is, it's a light-sensitive film that's applied to the screen using water. So that, that film, that capillary film, is similar to direct emulsion, but we've done the coating for you. So we've coated it industrially and coated it on to films, carrier sheets that you can apply later. So what some of the advantages are, it's very, very easy to use. Um, I can teach somebody to use capillary film, and unlike the direct emulsion, I guarantee that every screen going forward is going to be exactly the same and very easy. Uh, it has excellent resolution. It's a very clean process, very consistent. And capillary films can be shipped during the freezing temperatures, so it is freeze-thaw stable. Some of the disadvantages, it's a little bit more expensive than direct emulsion, but there's zero waste. So with zero waste, um, I can kind of prove in certain instances that it makes up for some of that cost difference. And it is less durable than direct emulsion because it is only being applied to one side of the screen. It doesn't fully encapsulate the mesh. So the, the three main stencil systems that are out there, 
Uh, there's diazo based, straight diazo based emulsion. Uh, this can be made in direct emulsion or capillary film. There's the diazo photopolymer, also known as dual cure, most commonly as a dual cure. And then there's pure photopolymers, also known as SPQs. Um, all three of these stencil systems can be made in either direct emulsion or capillary film. Uh, there, there are also hybrid pure photopolymers out there. So these are going to be the pure photopolymers that are going to be more water resistant or solvent resistant. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit more later as well. So diazo emulsion, straight diazo emulsion. Typically, this is going to be resistant to either water or solvents, but not both. It is greatly affected by humidity. It's got great edge definition, uh, mesh bridging resolution, and it has medium exposure latitude. So when I talk about exposure latitude, that talks about how forgiving that emulsion is. So you can be over on your exposure times or under on your exposure times, and the wider that exposure window is, the more forgiving that emulsion is going to be. And with straight diazone emulsions, you have to have a high EOM to achieve a low RZ. Uh, so what does that mean? So high EOM is going to be, EOM stands for emulsion over mesh, the thickness of your emulsion. So you have to have a much thicker stencil to have a lower RZ, which is the smoothness or the roughness of that stencil. Uh, the, the lower the RZ value, the smoother that stencil is. And the higher the EOM, the thicker that stencil is. With diazo emulsions, they need to be sensitized. So when you get that bucket of emulsion, what's in the bucket is actually unsensitized emulsion. It comes with a little bottle of diazo, which is the sensitizer. And to sensitize this, you need to fill up the diazo sensitizer bottle to the shoulder. So I mean where the, where the top of that bottle breaks. With water, I like to use warm water because it will help dissolve that diazo a lot easier. Not hot water because hot water will ruin the diazo, um, but warm water will help dissolve it a lot easier. Put the cap back on, shake it up for a good amount of time, and then pour that into the unsensitized bucket of emulsion and mix it all in to make it homogenous. Uh, after it's been mixed up and sensitized, you're going to have to let it sit for a couple hours as it goes through what's called the degassing process. There's actually nitrogen bubbles that are being released. Um, and if you were to coat screens with that emulsion right away, all of those bubbles are going to translate into pinholes later on. So it's best just to let it sit. Um, if possible, it's best to sensitize your emulsion today and then start using it the next day. But I know a lot of people are short on time and whatnot at times. So at least let it sit for a couple hours to degas. One thing I always recommend, once you sensitize your emulsion, write the date right on the label that you sensitized it. That way you know um, when you sensitize it. Because with a diazo emulsion, after it's been sensitized, you've got about four to six weeks, um, depending on how it's stored, temperature, humidity. Uh, a lot of times it can be closer to four weeks. But at least you know you've got that window, four to six weeks, and you know when you sensitized it if you wrote it right on the label. One of our most common diazo emulsions is our CP Tex. It's very high in solids, 44% solids. It's very water resistant. It's good with all mesh counts and it has medium latitude. Other diazo emulsions that we have are CP2, which as I said before, diazo emulsions can either be water resistant or solvent resistant, but they can't be both. So like I said, CP Tex is very water resistant, but it isn't solvent resistant. CP2, on the other hand, is very solvent resistant, but isn't very water resistant. Uh, and then we also have ImageMade DZ343 in the diazo categories. With the dual cure emulsions, they can be resistant to water solvents or both. Um, they're not as affected by humidity, and they can have excellent edge definition, mesh bridging and res resolution. They have a very wide exposure latitude, so it's very forgiving. Um, also, if you're working under not so great light safe conditions, the, you want to use something that's far more forgiving, um, something like a dual cure emulsion. It's very highly suitable for uh, use with four color process and high tolerance printing. So if you're trying to resolve something that's very fine, four color process, simulated process, I typically lean towards dual cure emulsions. Uh, 
Again, same process as the diazo emulsion. It needs to be sensitized, and that process is exactly the same. Uh, add water to the sensitizer bottle, pour it into the pre-sensitized emulsion, and mix that all up. Make it homogenous, let it sit, degas, uh, and once again, write the date that you mixed it so you've got that same four to six weeks after sensitizing. Our most common uh, dual cure emulsion in the textile industry is UDC-HV. It's high in solids again, 38% solids. Uh, it works with all inks. It has a very wide exposure latitude, so it's very forgiving. Uh, some of the other dual cure examples that we have are UDC-2, UDC-Glide, UDC-Ace, ImageMate DC-521. Uh, we have a, we've got a whole slew of dual cure emulsions. The next category, pure photopolymer emulsions. Um, so pure photopolymer emulsions can be resistant to water solvents or both, dependent on how it's mixed on our end in the chemistry makeup has very good edge definition, mesh bridging, resolution. Uh, but with pure photopolymers, they have a very narrow exposure latitude, so they're not as forgiving. And primarily that's because of the shorter exposure times. They're very fast exposing. Where dual cures and diazo emulsions are a little bit slower exposing, which opens up that exposure latitude window. Pure photopolymers being much faster exposing, you have to have your exposure time right on because they're not as forgiving. Um, with that, there's medium to low EOM to achieve low RZ. But one of the benefits to the pure photopolymer emulsions, there's no sensitizing needing. It's a one-part emulsion right out of the bucket. You don't have to mix it. Um, and because you don't have to mix it and sensitize it, it has a much longer shelf life. Where I said before, the diazo and dual cure emulsions, uh, you've got about four to six weeks to use it after you sensitize it. Pure photopolymer emulsions, you have about a two-year shelf life from when it's manufactured. Our most popular pure photopolymer emulsion that we make is Chromo Blue. Uh, we've been making it for quite a few years, and it's the most popular emulsion that we make overall, worldwide. Uh, it's very high in solids, 50% solids. It's got a two-year shelf life, but Chromo Blue is only designed for plastisol inks only. So if you're doing water-based or discharge, uh, it's not going to work with those processes. Um, Chromo Blue is very fast exposing, and with that, a uh, more narrow shell, a uh, more narrow exposure latitude. Some of the other pure photopolymer emulsions that we make is our Chromalime, which is rapidly gaining some momentum. Our Chromatech WR, which is a water-resistant emulsion, uh, pure photopolymer that has water resistance, and ImageMade PC701. So our next category is capillary films. So capillary films are UV light sensitive film used to create a stencil that when applied to a stream using water, adheres to the mesh using capillary action. It actually sucks into the mesh. Uh, you're gonna have the highest level of consistency with capillary film. There's very little waste, uh, especially compared to direct emulsion. Very simple process. As I mentioned before, I can teach somebody to use capillary film in a few minutes, and they're gonna be able to do the same thing over and over and over, exactly the same. It's going to be perfect every single time. Uh, so some of the capillary films that we make, we have our Procap, which is a diazo-based capillary film, Magnicure, which is a dual-cure-based capillary film, and then Razor and Quick Film, which are both pure photopolymer-based capillary films. In the textile industry, our pure photopolymer-based Quick Film is by far most popular. It's excellent for textile printing with plastisol inks. Uh, 40 microns is what it comes in as far as thickness. Only comes in one size, 15 inches by 17 inch cut sheets, and it comes in packs of 10 or 50. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention on capillary films as well is there isn't a capillary film on earth that works for water-based printing. Obviously, being the fact that it uses water to adhere to the screen, it can't be water resistant, otherwise it wouldn't be able to adhere to that screen. Um, so there isn't a capillary film that we make or any of our competitors make that are water resistant. We also have high density films. So high density films aren't exactly the same thing as a capillary film. Um, they're more of a pre they're more of a pre-sensitized film. They're ideal for heavy ink deposits in a variety of applications. 
They're designed for high density and special effects inks. They have a very fast exposure with excellent image quality for what they are. Even though the exposure times are much longer, that's because they're very thick stencils. Excellent screen buildup. Um, they're transparent for easy registration. Fast screen, around, screen turnaround times, and they're consistent and repeatable. So our super fat films are our high density films that we manufacture. They're coated in a wide range of thicknesses. They range from 100 microns all the way up to 700 microns. And they work with all of our chromaline direct emulsions. So with that, you need to use the direct indirect method. So these being pre-sensitized films, not actually capillary films, they don't adhere to the screen just using water. You have to use the direct indirect method. So with that, you would actually back coat the screen using direct emulsion and that direct emulsion would adhere the, the high density film, the super fat film to the mesh. They're very consistent, easy application, very repeatable, uh, and they're great for high density. So some of the factors for choosing the correct emulsion for your particular process. The main thing is what types of inks are you using? If you're using a water-based ink, the emulsion you choose better be water resistant. What are you printing on? The artwork demands, are you trying to do very fine line detail? Uh, what type of exposure unit are you using? Are you using LED? Are you using metal halide? Are you using fluorescent tube systems? Each one of those systems is going to lean towards a different type of emulsion that best suits it. What is the desired ink deposit that you're after? And, and lastly, what is your environment like? Are you working under light safe conditions or do you have white light creeping in somewhere? Um, if, if you're not working under light safe conditions and you've got some white light creeping in, you probably want to use something that's a little bit more forgiving. So what are the stencil requirements for water base and discharge inks? Like I said, the emulsion must have the maximum resistance to water. Uh, it must have the maximum exposure time as well. So if you're on the, the lower end of that exposure window, it won't be as durable as the higher end of that exposure window. So lean towards overexposure than underexposure when you're using water-based inks. Like I said before, CP Techs or Chromatech WR are very highly recommended in our product line. Some of the screen making essentials always work under yellow UV safe lights. Store your coated screens in a cool, dark, and dry environment. Your dryer screens below 110 degrees. I know a lot of people have DIY screen dryers uh, and drying cabinets that they've made where they put a space heater in there and crank that thing up because they think the hotter it is, the faster that screen's going to dry. Well, the fact is, when it gets above 110 degrees, it starts to damage that emulsion. So you want to keep it under 110 degrees. It's far more it's far more important to have good air movement in that screen drying cabinet um, versus the higher temperatures. Always use fresh emulsion. Like I said before, always put the the uh, the date that you mix it on so you know when you sensitized it. You've got that four to six weeks, or if it's a pure photopolymer, that two year shelf life. And always use an exposure calculator if anything changes, if you change emulsions, if you're using a different mesh count, you change the bulb in your exposure unit, uh, you're using a different coating sequence. If anything in your exposure uh, process changes whatsoever, the first thing you do should be doing an exposure test. So with screen prep, the last thing always should be degreasing. I know there's a lot of people out there that like to skip this step but I'll tell you, screens can't ever be too clean. Um, and, and clean both sides of it. Mesh is a three-dimensional object, so you want to scrub both sides of that mesh. Don't use household detergents. I've already seen people using Ajax, Simple Green, all that stuff. Please don't do that. One, it's not good for your screens. Um, it's not good for you to be working with. And the other thing is, they don't completely get rinsed off your screen properly. So degreasers that are developed for the screen process really break down with the water and rinse away a lot cleaner than a lot of those household detergents. Um, use a pressure washer, but then finalize with a, with a cascading rinse with just a garden hose. 
use that garden hose just gently over the top so that water cascades down. If you use a cascade rinse at the end, it's going to rinse far more of that degreaser off. If you just use a pressure washer, a lot of times what happens is as it goes through that screen, it's going to kick back up all of the foam and degreaser that's in the bottom of your washout booth, and that's going to kick back onto your screen, which can become a contaminant. If you don't get all the degreaser off your screen, it would be a contaminant as well. But if you don't degrease, all the oils in your skin, um, any of the oil-based products that you're using for screen reclaim uh, are still going to be left on there, which are going to make it so that the emulsion doesn't adhere to the mesh as well. So degreasing is very important. Some of the coating variables, uh, the coater edge profile, so whether it's a sharper edge or a rounder edge, the angle that you hold that scoop coater, the pressure, the speed that you're coating, and then obviously the number of coats on each side. Um, so certain emulsions you can just coat one in one, and certain emulsions you might have to do a three in one to get the desired ink deposit that you're after, or the EOM that you're trying to shoot for. Some of the coating tips, I always recommend using a scoop coater that is at least three inches smaller than the inside diameter of your screen. I know a lot of people like to use a scoop coater that goes right up to the frame, but the problem with that is the outside area of your screen is going to be much higher tension versus the center of your screen. So if you've got a scoop coater that goes all the way out to the edge, it's going to ride on those high tension pockets on the outside areas of your screen, leaving a much heavier deposit of emulsion in the middle and a much thinner deposit of emulsion towards the outside of your frame. Obviously, the variation of thick to thin, you won't ever get your screen properly exposed because you're trying to find the happy medium between where it's thicker and thinner. Always use a clean and nick-free coating trough. If you drop that scoop coater and you get a nick in it, throw that thing away. Use it to keep a door open somewhere or something like that, but that's about all it's good for. If you've got a nick in there, it's going to leave a, a streak in your coating every single time. A lot of people try using sandpaper, emery cloth, things of that nature to try to smooth that, that nick out that they put in that scoop coater trough. Um, the problem with that is now you're changing the profile of that edge. So if as you sand that down, you're making it a much sharper edge right there versus much rounder edge where you're not, um, where you're not sanding that down. And there, people say that they're really good at it and everything. Um, it doesn't make a difference how good you are at that. There's going to be variation along the edge profile of that coating trough. So once I said, like I said, if you get a nick in it, a ding in it, throw that thing away. They're not that expensive. Um, all of our distributors sell them. Like I said, I'll use this fresh emulsion and be consistent. You'll hear me say be consistent over and over and over um, because it is, it is the main thing that really... Um, is needed for screen making. If you have variations in how you do things, you can never have repeatable, consistent results. So you can never have expectations uh, of what of what really to expect out of your screens. Some of the coding technique tips: use both hands for best control. Uh, I, I'm <laughs> I'm at fault with this one too. A lot of times I use one hand, but I can guarantee that by using both hands you're going to have far more control and it's going to be far more consistent from both sides of the screen. Coat slowly to ensure even coverage. Coat that substrate side first and always finish with the squeegee side, the inside of that screen. So it doesn't make a difference how many times you coat your screen, the last pass always needs to come from the squeegee side pushing the emulsion through to the bottom side of that screen. And like I said before, coat in a light, safe environment always. So with wet on wet coating techniques, uh, dependent on the emulsion, I, like I said before, you could need to coat your screen one and one, or you could coat it all the way up to one and four, dependent on how thick you want that stencil to be. Once you coat that screen, you're going to always want to dry it squeegee side up, um, just like it would go into your press, because as it dries, Gravity is going to pull that emulsion through down to the bottom side of your screen, and that's where you want all of your emulsion. We have leveling agents in all of our emulsions, too, so it's going to make it even out as, as, uh, as it dries and emulsion pulls that down. 
So this just shows here uh, one passes versus two passes versus three passes using a sharp edge of the scoop coder. Whereas the difference between these graphics and these graphics where you're using a round edge scoop coder, you can see using a rounded edge scoop coder essentially just puts more emulsion down faster. I typically use the round edge for most of the screens that I make other than my higher mesh counts. The higher mesh counts, you're going to want to have a little bit of a thinner stencil anyways, because you're trying to resolve much finer details. But um, I primarily use the round edge for, for most of the stencils that I'm making. So tips on drying. Uh, you're going to want to dry in total darkness. So even if you're working under yellow light safe conditions, that just slows down the exposure process. Those yellow UV light sleeves really are still letting some UV light through and are affecting your screen. So after you coat your screens, they should be dried in total darkness. Dry it squeegee side up, like I mentioned. Don't go above 110 degrees. Air movement is also good, but don't position fans blowing directly on your freshly coated screens. So. I've never seen a perfectly clean fan in my life in any shop I've ever been to. They always are good at collecting dust and debris. So when those screens are drying, it's just going to take that dust and debris that it's collected and blow that dust and debris onto those freshly coated screens, which will in turn turn into pinholes later on on, on press. You're going to want to store those coated screens in a cool, dark, dry environment. And I always like to recommend coat today and use those screens tomorrow. That way it'll ensure that the screens are thoroughly dry all the way through. Uh, I like to use the analogy, it's like holding a tomato. You can feel the outside of that tomato and it might be dry, but if you put your finger in the middle of that, it's wet in the inside. And that's a lot of times what happens with screens too. You go and feel the screen on the outside and it feels dry to the touch, but the inside of that screen might not be thoroughly dry all the way through. If the screen isn't thoroughly dry, it's gonna act underexposed. Um, and obviously underexposure is going to lead to a lot of different problems. Screens that aren't fully dry are going to act like that and they're going to break down a lot earlier on press. Um, this just shows the shrinkage that happens during the drying process. So you can see that top line, their wet coated screens are nice and thick and as it dries it starts to form to the mesh, it starts to form to those threads. Um, and you can see the very bottom line there uh, and, and on all these slides too, the stencil, the top is always the squeegee side, the bottom is always the substrate side on any of these graphics I have. So you can see the bottom where it's fully dried, it still has a little bit of a ridge, but it's not as rough as the top side of that screen. So as it dries, like I said, it's going to smooth out on the bottom, but it's still going to form to those threads. This is just an SEM photo of exactly that. The shrinkage that happens so you can see that the emulsion is going to form to the threads and it's going to create hills and valleys um, in your stencil so solid percentage you always hear about emulsion reps talking about the solid percent of their emulsions so what does that mean the percent solids refers to the ratio of the solid mass in that emulsion versus the liquids and the water that are in the emulsion so for example, CP Tex has 44% solids, which means it is 56% water. After a screen is dried, all of the water is evaporated out and you're only left with the solid percentage that's on that screen. So if you think about it, 56% of that emulsion is being evaporated away and you're only left with the solids. So that goes back to not all emulsions are created equal. A higher, a higher percentage of emulsion, you'll have to use less emulsion to get a better stencil than you would an emulsion with a lower uh, percentage of solids. So say you have an emulsion that's low 20%, so say it's 20%, that means 80% of that emulsion is water. And when you coat that screen, 80% of that cheaper emulsion is going to evaporate away. Um, so that goes back to the cost. You know, obviously water is much cheaper than the solids that we're using in the emulsions. So when you look at it, just bucket to bucket, an emulsion to emulsion, 
you might say, well, this one is a couple dollars cheaper. I want to use that. But what you don't realize is you're actually going to be using more of that product in your process than you would something that's higher in solids. Um, so you just will be wasting more emulsion was it really comes down to with those lower solid contents. So stencil thickness. Um, so as I mentioned before, the emulsion over mesh uh, talks about the thickness of your, of your stencil, the thickness of the emulsion. So you can use a thickness gauge to measure the total thickness of that stencil. So with a, a thickness gauge, you're actually going to measure the thickness of the mesh, and then you're going to measure the thickness of the mesh plus emulsion and subtract the two. That's going to be the emulsion over mesh. So it's just the thickness of the emulsion thicker than the stencil itself. Um, so the recommended stencil thickness um, that I typically recommend and a lot of our other industry experts do is a, a 10 to 20 percent emulsion over mesh ratio. So if you were to think about your overall stencil thickness mesh plus emulsion if you're looking at um, about 100 microns overall stencil thickness, 10% of that should just be the emulsion difference. Um, like I said, if you measure just the mesh and then you measure mesh and emulsion combination, you should be somewhere around that 10% ratio uh, for emulsion over mesh. The finer the detail, the thinner the stencil that you really should be after. So if you're on the higher side, 20%, 25%, and you're trying to resolve something very thin, that might be too thick of a stencil and you might have to coat it a little bit thinner to resolve those thinner details. This graphic here shows the stencil thickness and how it affects your print. So if you have too thin of a stencil, it's not going to create a good gasket and the ink is actually going to seep underneath the emulsion. So you're going to get kind of a stair steppy pattern like you see on the left. Now if you have too thick of a stencil, all of the ink can get, some of the ink can get hung up in the screen as you're printing. It's not going to clear thoroughly. So you can see you kind of get that same kind of wavy mottled uh, look where it doesn't have nice sharp edges uh, like you're after. Whereas if you have the correct amount of emulsion on your screen, the correct ratio, it's going to create a nice sharp gasket and it's not going to allow the ink to seep underneath the emulsion but it's also going to be the proper thickness, whereas all the ink will clear out of that out of that screen. So uh, that's where it's it's very important to not be too thick. It's important not to be too thin. Uh, everybody's always looking for that that one hit white, and um, a lot of times it doesn't have to do with the ink itself. It has to do how that screen was made. So if you have too thick, like I said, it's not going to clear properly and too thin, you're going to lose your resolution on your edges. Um, but that one hit white, it, a lot of times it doesn't have to do with the ink, but how that stencil is made. So this graphic here shows the stencil's thickness versus resolution. The finest detail that you should be able to print should be to twice as wide as the total stencil thickness. So say that again. The finest details, so the very smallest line or dot that you're able to print, should be twice as wide as your total stencil thickness. So say you're trying to, like this example here, you're trying to resolve something that is 200 microns because the overall stencil thickness is 100 microns thick. If you're trying to do something finer, um, it's just not gonna. It's just not gonna print properly. The slide here shows the resolution versus stencil thickness. So obviously, as your stencil gets too thick, you can see that that top layer uh, is is the film positive, and where the the black areas are, that's where it's printed. The white is the clear open area of your film positive that allows the light to come through. Um, but you can see if your stencil is too thick, where if you look at that bottom graphic, it's too thick versus too small of a dot that you're trying to print. So the light is going to start to creep around and actually close, close around that dot, not leaving it open. So if it's not open, obviously ink isn't going to get through. Uh, a good example of that is this photo here. Here they're trying to do a very small register mark. 
Uh, it's just too fine of detail for that overall stencil thickness. Obviously, that's not open, um, so ink is not passing through that, and you're not able to print that small register mark. Printable resolution. The a good rule of thumb is two threads to one mesh opening. So the smallest dot that you should be able to print should cover two threads in one mesh opening. As you can see, these dots here are far too small. If, it, if it's just a, the width of one thread um, or a mesh opening, you're going to see that it's not going to hold on there. So if you looked at the shadow areas on the left side graphic, that's going to just be completely flooded versus the highlighted area, none of those dots are going to print. Uh, you're not going to have anything coming through whatsoever. So what happens during stencil exposure? You've got the UV light and you've got your film positive. So the, the film positive where it's black and printed is blocking that UV light. Where it's not printed and is still clear, the UV light passes through and that UV light hardens the emulsion. Where it's, where it's blocking it and light has not hit the emulsion, it's going to stay soft. So when you go to wash it out, where light has not affected that screen and has not exposed the emulsion, that emulsion is just going to wash away in the unhardened areas. And where it has been exposed and the emulsion has been hardened, it's going to remain in your screen. This slide just kind of shows what happens during the exposure and the reaction that happens. Um, you can see on the the left side, that's a typical diazo reaction. So if you look at the green squiggly lines, uh, that is the PVA. The yellow dots is actual diazo that you're putting in there. And you've got the additives, which are the big red dots. So you can see after exposure happens, the diazo is going to reach out and grab onto the PVA, making it solid. Uh, on the, the typical pure photopolymer SPQ reaction side, you can see those polymers will actually reach out and grab onto each other as well as the PVA. So it's just a little bit of a different reaction. However, the end result is the same for you guys. There are a couple different ways that exposure times are measured. They're either measured in light units or they're measured in seconds. So what light units are, they're a measurement of a given amount of UV and time combined, where seconds are only a measurement of time. So with an exposure unit that has a light integrator involved with it, it's actually measuring how much UV is outputting from that light. And it will actually change the time of a light unit as that bulb diminishes over time. Typically with a brand new bulb, one light unit is close to one second with a brand new bulb, but as as it diminishes over time, it puts out less and less UV light. Um, a year later, it could be up to three seconds for that one light unit. But it's always going to be the same amount of light units. Whereas if your exposure unit doesn't have a light integrator um, in that exposure unit, you constantly have to be changing your exposure times and adjusting because as that bulb diminishes, you have to keep increasing time to have proper exposure. There are a couple different ways of determining your exposure time. Uh, the, the first easiest, quickest way is with an exposure calculator. But if you don't have an exposure calculator, uh, you can do a step test. And I'll go through both of those uh, procedures. First, I'll go through what the exposure calculator is and how to use that. So with the exposure calculator, it is a piece of film, just like this here. And on the one side, it has a filter that is taped to it. Uh, each one, of you can see, it's, it's essentially the, the first few steps of the Stouffer scale. But uh, each one of these steps filters out a given amount of UV light. So the way to properly use this is you would expose it for double the time that you expect your exposure to be. So take an educated guess. What your, what your current times are uh, right now, if it's, if it's making a screen, it might not be perfect, but um, use that time because it's got to be close. So expose it for double the time of your educated guess. 
Then you're going to develop and dry the screen as you normally would, so wash it out, dry it. And then you're going to inspect each one of the resolution targets on the left side to determine the correct exposure time, looking at the lines that look the clearest and the sharpest. So after you develop it, you take a loop, magnifier, look at the lines and see which ones have the sharpest lines, that they're not following the threads, they're not looking like a stair step, they're nice sharp straight lines. Whichever one of these patches looks the best, that is the correct exposure time. And right next to that step, there's a little factor. So say, say this middle one right here looked the best, it says 0.5 right next to it, that is the target factor. So you would take that factor times the time that you shot your screen at for the, for the test, and that is your correct exposure time. So say you shot this at two minutes, 0.5 times two minutes, your correct time is one minute, if that makes sense. Uh, so you're looking for good mesh bridging. What I mean by good mesh bridging, this graphic here, this SEM photo, shows excellent mesh bridging. You can see how the lines are nice and crisp and straight, and they don't follow the threads themselves. They're nice and straight and sharp. That's what you're looking for when you're looking at those target resolution um, targets. So whichever one looks as close to this as possible, that is the correct exposure time, the correct target that you're after. If you don't have an exposure calculator, the second way that you can determine your correct exposure times is by doing a simple step test. So what a step test is, is you would take, you'd take your screen, it would be coated, dried, put a piece of film on, any film will do, and then you take a piece of cardboard and actually block a given amount of your screen, say it's 80% of your screen, shoot it for a given amount of time, uh, so say 30 light units, 30 seconds. Then you're going to move that cardboard down, shoot it for another 30 seconds. Move it down, shoot it for another 30 seconds. Move it down, shoot it for another 30 seconds. And at the end, you end up having uh, a bunch of different exposure times all on that same screen. So with the graphic here, you can see the, the first step as was open. Uh, would actually get hit all six times in this example. So as that cardboard moves down, that first step gets hit every single time with the 30 seconds. So you can see 30 seconds compounds on top of each other. And as you move that cardboard back, you can see the first step was hit 30 seconds. The second step was hit 60 seconds. 90 seconds, 120 seconds, and so on and so forth. So what you end up with is a screen that looks similar to this. You can each see each one of those steps uh, increases in the amount of time. So after, after developing, you're going to look at your screen and it should look something like this. So once again, you're looking for resolution in each one of those steps. Uh, again, similar to what we looked at before. Um, you can actually use, if you have the exposure calculator, but you lose the little filter, you can use this as your, uh, your film by doing a step test too and actually step it off from the film. But you're just going to be looking at each line to see which holds the best resolution. But with a diazo-based emulsion or a dual-cure emulsion, any emulsion that has diazo in it, it's actually called the tanning process, and you'll see a color shift as it increases in exposure time. So if it's underexposed, it's going to continue to change color until it stops changing color where that's the hardening point is. So you would have, uh, if you look at the graphic here, you'd see that step six, severely underexposed, it was only hit by 30 units. And you can see there's a color shift between six and five. There's still a color shift between five and four and still between four and three, but at that three, you can see one, two, and three actually are the same color, which tells me that's the hardening point of the emulsion. That's where I would put your exposure time at, and I would add 10% to that. Um, 
that's that's typically where I like to add I add 10% to where the hardening point is to put you just a little bit above uh, what the the proper exposure is to put you within that window. So what is underexposure? Uh, when you expose a screen, the the screen is exposed linearly. So as you can see, the the light's going to hit the front of the screen, and the longer it exposes it's going to make its way through to the back side of that screen. The longer, uh, the, the thicker the stencil, obviously, the longer your exposure time because that light has to creep all the way through and harden the emulsion thoroughly all the way to the back side of that screen. If your emulsion is slimy on the inside of the screen or color comes off when you're developing on your hand or really if it feels slimy, that's a telltale sign that your screen is underexposed. And poor under underexposure will result in poor anchoring of the stencil, causing mesh, uh, poor mechanical resistance, and the unhardened emulsion can wash away during developing as well. You can see with this photo here, this is a severely underexposed screen. The backside never got enough light to harden, and when it was developed, all washed away. And you can see the emulsion is just lifting right off that, that mesh. There's nothing that's holding it on there. Uh, th this picture, too, on, on the far right, you can see that it's fully exposed. So the back side, those threads are fully encapsulated, where, where it's severely underexposed on the far left side. Those threads are completely bare, and there's no emulsion that's holding on from the back side of that stencil. That's going to be a very weak stencil versus where it's fully exposed. If that emulsion is fully exposed and fully encapsulating those threads, it's going to be far more durable. The difference between dyed and undyed mesh, you can see here. As the UV light goes into those white threads, it's going to bounce around on the inside of the stencil. It's actually going to follow those threads like a fiber optic and expose from the inside as well as the outside. So that light is scattering all over in the inside of that stencil and it won't give you a very good sharp resolution. From an emulsion manufacturer standpoint, I wish that there wasn't any white mesh <laughs> ever. I wish it was all yellow mesh because yellow mesh is going to give you the best resolution possible. It's going to be a little bit slower exposure times because that yellow mesh is actually absorbing the light uh, and it's not exposing from the inside, it's only exposing directionally, but it's going to give you much crisper, cleaner edge definition versus where the light is bouncing around all over the place and creeping out from around where your, your, art, uh, your stencil is. Um, when you've got your film positive, the light is actually going to creep around your film positive and it's going to close in some of the smaller dots just from that light scatter. So that, that's the main differences. Yellow mesh is going to expose slower, but it's going to give you better resolution. White mesh is going to expose faster, but give you poorer resolution. Um, typically, you'll only see the white mesh on the lower mesh counts. So say like 156 and below, you'll, you'll see white mesh. But usually on those lower mesh counts, you're not doing anything that's extremely fine detail anyways. You'll always see your 230s, your 305s, always with yellow mesh because you're trying to resolve much finer details. Again, this graphic just shows the mesh bridging. Uh, on the left, you've got poor mesh bridging. This could be because your stencil is too thin. It could be because your stencil is underexposed. Uh, but whatever the case is, that's poor mesh bridging and that's that's not a good stencil. On the right, obviously it's going to be much closer to what your actual artwork is. It's properly exposed. It's meshing, it's bridging over those mesh openings instead of following the threads. Um, that's going to be proper exposure time, proper EOM. Uh, overall, a much better stencil is going to be, uh, a much better print is going to be produced with that stencil on the right. This shows good edge definition. You can see the wall. Um, the wall is what we're talking about on the, the edge of that stencil. You want that to be as smooth and as straight as possible. That's going to give you the best resolution possible. 
This SEM is from our, our alpha line of emulsions for the electronics industry. Um, this is actually our alpha E20. Uh, we're producing 15 micron lines with this. Uh, and this is actually a coated one in four on a 400 um, stainless steel mesh. So you can see that that's extremely fine detail. The, the wall is extremely sharp and flat and uh, the, the best quality possible. And for the electronics industry, that's, that's what we need. It needs to be the, and they keep pushing the limits for the, the smaller the, the line possible. Um, so here we're, like I said, we're resolving 15 to 20 micron lines. And uh, to put that in perspective, one red blood cell is about eight, eight microns wide. So about the width of two red blood cells is the line that we're holding on this 400 stainless steel uh, screen here. This SEM photo shows an emulsion uh, with large particles. The problem with this is when an emulsion is manufactured with larger particles, yes, it can be manufactured cheaper. Um, but when you go to print, your ink is going to be hung up in all of those little crevices and caves. Uh, it doesn't have a very sharp edge. It doesn't have a very sharp wall. So your, your resolution is going to suffer. Um, but also, when you go to clean that screen out, go to clean the ink out, all the ink is going to be hung up in there, and that can lead to ghosting and ink transfer during printing as well. So, once again, as I said earlier, not all emulsions are manufactured at the same level. So, some, some emulsions are made much cheaper using much larger particles, and that's, that's one way to make it much cheaper. But your resolution is going to suffer. You're going to have a harder time in reclaim um, and then the longevity of that screen with ghosting is going to suffer as well with an emulsion like this one here. This also shows uh, the stencil roughness and how that, uh, how that affects the gasket. So if you've got a rough stencil, the bottom of your screen is going to be rough like this. You can see that ink is going to seep out and it's not going to create a good gasket. Now that could be a screen that's underexposed. It could be a screen that is uh, too thin. But when you have the proper thickness and the proper exposure, it's going to create a nice gasket and you're going to have nice sharp edges. So you can see the difference whereas the ink seeps underneath that stencil with the rough stencil where you have a nice smooth surface to your stencil, it's going to create a nice gasket and you're going to have a nice sharp edge, nice sharp resolution. This just shows exactly that. So the print on the left uh, was done with an underexposed stencil, which was too thin because a lot of that emulsion had, had washed away. You can actually see where each one of the threads uh, actually dictates where the, the, the ink seeps out underneath that stencil. Whereas on the, the right side, that print uh, is much sharper, much cleaner, um, because it is the, the proper thickness and the proper exposure time. Same here. Uh, this is an underexposed too thin stencil, and you're getting dot gain. Uh, you can see each one of those threads. You can see each one, each one of the knuckles of the mesh where that was. Um, and you, you can see that those starburst patterns instead of nice, smooth, round-shaped dots. So getting into film positives, um, there's, there's a few different film positives that are out there in this industry. The top image setter silver film uh, is going to be su superior quality. It's the highest resolution, but it's very expensive. It's tough to get the chemistry these days. Um, there, there aren't too many people that are making their films that way. The, the films that we use with our exposure calculators, however, are done on an image setter. Um, the bottom side, vellum, is going to be very poor quality, poor resolution, uh, cheap, but it has, it's going to give you registration problems because it's a hot process. So as that vellum goes through your laser printer being a hot process, it, ex it shrinks, but it doesn't shrink at the same rate. Uh, 
So now all of those, say so you're doing a multiple color job, if your vellums don't line up, your screens are never going to line up. So when you get to press, the job is never going to be in perfect registration. Um, also, it lets a lot of light through through the dark printed areas because you can't print it very dark. And the areas that are printed uh, let through just about as much light as the dark printed areas. So now you're constantly having to underexpose your screens using vellum and just to get any sort of image to wash out. Um, we manufacture inkjet film, which is very high quality. You can get excellent resolution. It's printed typically with Epson printers, but it's a cold process, um, so it doesn't shrink and expand. So those films are gonna line up much easier. And the, the clear areas are gonna let a lot more UV light through to harden your stencil, where the black printed dark areas are going to block far more light than you would with vellum as well. So this graph here just shows the difference. Um, D-min would be if you use a spectrophotometer and were to measure the clear areas you would have as close to zero would be perfectly clear and the darker the printed areas on that film would be would be a higher D-max. So you can see the difference between vellum. Those numbers are much closer to each other, whereas inkjet film, those numbers are much farther apart. And the farther apart those numbers are, uh, the D max to D, D, D min uh, is going to give you a better opportunity at making a better stencil. Uh, if you take it even one step further with an image setter film, the, uh, the D min would be next to nothing, where D max would be off the charts on this graph here. So vellum versus inkjet film. Um, vellum pros. The only positive to vellum is it's cheap. Uh, but vellum cons, the vellum being a hot process, like I said, the shrinkage and registration issues on multiple color jobs. It's not very transparent, which is going to lead to underexposure. It doesn't print very dark, so it's going to lead to poor image quality, poor resolution. And a lot of times when you're working with vellum, because it is going to be underexposed, uh, you're going to have a lot of pinhole issues. Whereas inkjet film is the complete opposite. So inkjet film being a cold process, it's very stable, very consistent, so you can have precise registration. Uh, it's very transparent, so it's going to allow more UV light to pass through, which would allow for lower exposure times, and properly exposed screens are achievable. Uh, it, the black printed area, you can print very black opaque imaging, which can lead to excellent resolution and image quality. And because of that, you're going to have fewer pinholes. Your screen is going to be properly exposed, so you're going to have fewer pinholes. The only con for inkjet film is it's more expensive per square inch than vellum. However, because of the time lost when you're trying to register jobs uh, and screens breaking down and pinhole issues, I can actually prove that even though you're paying more for an inkjet film versus a piece of vellum, you're actually saving money using inkjet film uh, and you're going to be putting out much higher quality products. Some of the most common screen problems that are out there, um, you're going to have washout breakdown or adhesion loss. Uh, where it's difficult to wash out during developing, scumming or haze. So what scumming is, is that if you ever develop a screen and go to print it, it, it seems like it's, it seems like the image is open, but it's not allowing ink to go through. And you can take a wet rag and rub on that open area of your, of your graphic, and then you can start printing and it, and it opens up. That's scumming. Um, poor image sawtoothing. So before where I said uh, you're looking for good mesh bridging, not where you see that stair-steppy sawtoothing, uh, that's that poor image and sawtoothing, undercutting, and pinholes, which is probably the most common screen problem people have. So what causes washout breakdown or adhesion loss? Uh, poor coating methods, pre-exposure, so after you coat your screens, if they're not stored in a perfect light-safe environment, some of that light can start to expose the screen, 
where it's almost exposing in layers. Um, when you go to wash your screen out, it almost peels off instead of melting away the open area. If you have outdated cap film or outdated emulsion, that can lead to wash-up problems or adhesion loss. The screen isn't dry enough. Um, like I said before, if your screen isn't dry enough, it's going to act underexposed. If you have improper adhesion of the capillary film, so you just didn't have enough water on the screen when you were applying the capillary film or something of that nature, the water temperature being too hot when you're developing your screens, excessive water pressure if you're just blasting your screens with far too much pressure, uh, underexposure, obviously, and contaminated dirty mesh. So if your screens aren't degreased well enough, uh, that's going to lead to adhesion problems. Difficult washing out during developing. So if you've got a poor positive, saying you're using vellum and lights passing through that black printed area, it's probably going to expose that area as well, and it's going to be tough to wash that your open area of your image away. Pre-exposure, like I said, if it's being affected by white lights before you go to expose that screen, now that outer layer of emulsion is exposed, and when you go to develop it and wash it out, it's almost going to peel away instead of melting. Uh, again, outdated material, excessive heat dur during drying, so like I said before, keep it under 110. If you're above that, it's going to start to damage that emulsion or overexposure. If your screen is overexposed, um, it, it might start to expose and creep in on your image area. Scumming or haze. Uh, a lot of times light scatter can cause scumming. That's where if uh, you're using white mesh and you have a lot of light scatter within there. Again, pre-exposure, poor positive or poor contact. So say your vacuum isn't drawing down well enough and you're not getting good contact between your film and the emulsion, light can seep around and create scumming as well. Uh, excessive, excessive moisture in the screen room. So say you're in your screen room, you're, you're drying your screens, coating your screens, exposing your screens, washing out your screens all in the same area. Where you're washing out your screens shouldn't be in the same room where you're doing your exposure. You want to keep your wet process and your dry process completely apart from each other. Uh, also, underexposure can create scumming or haze as well. Poor image or saw saw-toothing, uh, so poor positive again to screen contact, undercutting, incorrect drying of the emulsion, so if it's not dry all the way, stencils too thin, inconsistent light exposure, so say there's something wrong with your exposure unit, it's not putting out a consistent amount of UV every exposure time, or incorrect exposure. If it's underexposed, uh, typically that's going to see you're going to see poor image and sawtoothing if you're underexposed. If you have undercutting, uh, the placement of your positive, the light scatter within the mesh, if you're using white threads again, uh, inconsistent exposure to the light, improper exposure. Poor contact, so if, again, the vacuum isn't drawing down, light can seep around that black printed area of your film positive. All of those can create undercutting. And the, the biggest thing screen makers have to fight is pinholes, underexposure, too thin of a, of a stencil, dirty positives or dirty exposure unit, air bubbles in the coating, ink to stencil incompatibility so that what I mean by that is say you're you're using uh, chroma blue which is only designed for plastisol inks only but you're using water-based inks with it it can start to break down you can start to have pinhole issues because it's breaking that down uh, if your stencil isn't dry it's going to act underexposed which can create pinholes a poor light source inadequate degreasing poor reclaiming so once again if your screens just aren't getting cleaned well enough Press the screen wash incompatibility. So um, say your screen wash that you're using on press is too hot uh, for the emulsion. It's a very hot solvent. It could break down that emulsion dependent on the solvent resistance of that particular emulsion. And if you just have an overall dirty print environment, uh, keeping thin, things clean, you know, your, your exposure area uh, if you're blasting fans on your on your wet screens, just any dust and debris that's in that area can lead back to pinhole issues. 
one thing that I, I'll also add with the uh, the troubleshooting, we've got this we've got this nice little troubleshooting guide here, and this troubleshooting guide goes through each one of the most common screen problems and then their causes and what to what to do about those problems. Uh, if anybody wants to to reach out to me, you can send me an email. I'd be happy to to mail you one of these. It's essentially what I just went through on the last few slides, but it's a really good tool to have in every screen room. Um, so if you have a problem, you just look and see what the problem is and what the potential causes are of that problem. If you ever need technical support, please reach out to me. Uh, again, Kevin Kauf, I'm the Midwest sales rep. You got my email address there. Mick Orr, he's our application specialist. He's been doing it for a long time. He's very knowledgeable. Uh, you've got his email address listed there. And then on our website, chromaline.com, chromaline uh, with the video, it, it, we've got a bunch of different videos on there that go through showing exactly how to do the exposure calculator, how to code screens, how to apply capillary film, how to apply fat film, the high density film. We've got great videos on there of how to do each one of these technical applications. Uh, so I, I recommend everybody takes a look at some of the videos that we have out there. Again, we're on all of the social media platforms, Instagram, Emulsion Guru, that's the, the account that I have and run. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and all the, you know, all the good social media outlets. Put, try to put out as much good content as we can. Um, but yeah, follow us on there. If you've got questions ever, reach out to me on any of that as well. And um, I'll be looking forward to doing the live Q&A with everybody. I think I'm going to try to do live Q&A periodically uh, on, on YouTube here. So uh, thanks again for taking the time and spending some time with me and um, looking at your the screen making. Thanks.